You know, a lot of things that we do that are uniquely Christian, we've, we've done some of them uh, this morning. Uh, you know, we've had communion, a wonderful fellowship, evangelism, baptism. All these things are traditionally Christian activities. But of all the Christian things that we do, however, the thing that we probably do most often is to pray. We pray when we eat. We pray when we are at worship. We pray when we're alone. We pray at devos. We pray when visiting sick people. We pray during times of trouble and despair or when we are happy, we pray. In the Muslim religion, they are obliged to pray five times a day and sometimes people say, wow, that's a lot. Boy, we blow past that like nothing. Like nothing, you know? I mean, just, just mealtime. We're praying. We probably rack up more time praying than any other spiritual exercise that we do as Christians. For this reason, the activity of prayer seems sometimes to get a little bit stale, a little bit boring. Ah, what do I say now? We repeat the same thing over again. Like everything else, you know, if you repeat it often enough, it begins to feel a little old, maybe even feel ineffective. So this morning I'd like to encourage you in your prayer life and give you some reasons why you should persevere in prayer. You should persevere in prayer because it is needed. It is sorely needed. In Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, Paul the Apostle tells us that the true struggle going on in this world is not between countries, it's not between economic systems or ideologies. These things merely reflect the real struggle. No, the true struggle, Paul says, is against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places in the heavenly places. The battle is against Satan and his evil forces that are continually trying to destroy the church and the spread of the word of God. Some people have wisdom from below and can only see the small picture. And believe me, the small picture are human wars and politics and power. I know they suck up a lot of energy, these things, but that's the small picture. But to some, God has given through His word the ability to see the big picture, and that is that the battle in the spiritual realm creates the battle in the physical realm. That's the big picture. Some choose to fight with guns and diplomacy and financial wheeling and dealing and controlling the oil reserves and whatever. You know, the local battles for territory and money and temporary power. Others choose to fight the battle on the first front, the spiritual front against the true enemies, and they fight this battle with the Bible, the Holy Spirit, and yes, with prayer. Prayer is the battleground for the Christian. Paul says that the wage of sin or the wages of sin is death in Romans chapter 6 verse 23. And Peter says that Satan continually prowls around to devour. In other words, Satan is continually trying to find ways to seduce people into sin in order to create death and the symptoms of death in their lives. You don't just die when your heart, like Brother Rex, 95, his heart stops, he's dead. You don't just die then. The symptoms of death are violence and anger and immorality and suffering. Those are all the symptoms of the death that exists in this world because of sin. And so prayer is needed to counteract Satan's attacks in many ways. For example, we need to pray for workers to go out and preach the gospel so Satan will not destroy the ignorant. Jesus talks about in 9.30. What do you think this 
you know, what do you think this battle going on now that we read about ISIS and Al Qaeda and all these groups, what are they trying to do? They're trying to control territory. They're trying to control land mass. Why? Because in all the land mass that they control, there's no way that the gospel will ever get in there. That's what the battle is about. So we need to pray for workers who will go into places where the gospel can reach people who are trapped, who are prisoners, not just in jail, but prisoners of ideology, satanic ideology. We also need to pray for those who suffer because of the direct or indirect results of sin in their lives. The, the victims of war, the victims of disease and suffering, victims of broken families, the list of damage due to sin just goes on and on and on. We could spend all morning just listing the victims. God tells us to pray for healing and support and restoration from these things. James chapter five, verse 15. And we also need to pray that God opens our eyes so that we can continually see the big picture because the little picture is so loud. It's got such a big microphone. It consumes all the media, but it's the little picture. We need to pray that God opens the minds and hearts of people so they get to see the big picture. Elisha, the prophet, prayed that his servant would see the host of heaven encircling their enemies so as not to be afraid. In 2 Kings, his servant and Elisha were being attacked and the servant was afraid because of the number of enemies around them. And Elisha prayed that his servant's eyes would be open so he could see that around the enemy there was another circle and that circle was the angels that were protecting them. Paul prayed that the brethren could see the heavenly gifts awaiting those who were faithful to Christ until death, Ephesians 1, verse 18. I wonder if that's what you see as you die, as you are transferred into the next dimension. I wonder if that's what you see. Not just the light, but you begin to see the things that God has promised to give you for remaining faithful a lifetime. We need to pray for vision, not just things. Vision to see how we fit into God's picture and what position we will fill in the ongoing battle against these forces in the heavenly places. Every prayer, whether it, uh, it's for breakfast or to restore someone for illness or to gain strength for vision, Every prayer is always needed because it is relevant to what life is really about. So we need to pray because it is needed, sorely needed. We also need to pray because prayer is the basic ministry of the church. You know, we have in the past explained the quote ministry system in the church. You know, you remember that. I've said it many times. There are five basic ministries in the church. Evangelism, education, fellowship, worship, service. Those are the only five ministries of the church. That's, those are the areas that we work in. Those are the biblical ministry. And I've told you that when each of these activities is being carried out, the individuals as well as the entire church grows. But each of these individual ministry groups needs prayer to be effective. And so we need to pray for teachers and their effectiveness and their faithfulness. We need to pray for outreach efforts. We need to pray that the brethren draw closer together. We need to pray that God provide the resources and the talents so we can serve effectively. We need to pray that our worship is in spirit and truth. We need to pray that our leaders remain wise and faithful as well as healthy 
and focused on their task. Prayer is basic because no matter what your physical or economic limitations, you can make a difference in this church through a strong and persistent prayer life. And so we should never stop praying because prayer is needed, because prayer is the basic ministry of the church, and also because prayer is powerful. Sometimes I hear people say things like, you know, things are going badly and you know, not sure what's going on and they say, well, you know, we could always pray. Or uh, uh, let's pray, it can't hurt. I've heard somebody say that to me once. You know, I said, shall we pray? He said, yeah, go ahead, it, might, it can't hurt. <laughs> it's like I didn't want to then, you know, and I'm saying, oh yeah, never mind then. You know. <laughs> Statements like this reveal that we don't recognize the power of prayer. You know, prayer is not wishful thinking. Prayer is not desperation. Prayer is powerful and it's powerful for several reasons. First of all, it is strong enough to defeat our most powerful enemy. Satan is a mighty spiritual being, much stronger than humans. Jesus tells us that prayer is our defense against him in 1 Peter 5 and 8. And Luke 22, 31 and 32. Our task is not to beat up Satan, our task is to resist him, to resist him. We can't beat him up. We don't have that kind of power, but we can resist. And prayer is the first step in that resistance. Secondly, prayer is powerful because it's directed towards the God who is all-powerful. You know, the reason prayer is so powerful is because the object of it has all the power. A million prayers to an idol is worthless. Worthless. A zealous prayer with sacrifice without a clean heart is useless. Any prayer made without reference to Jesus Christ or longing for Him is not heard. But the smallest voice, the weakest hands, lifted to God in Jesus' name is heard and forever remembered by the creator of the heavens and the earth. Those little children offering up, you ever see kids you know, offering up prayer? You, you ask the kid to lead the prayer before you eat? You know you're going to be eating cold food, right? Because they go on and on and on. You know, thank you for mommy and daddy and my bicycle and our dog and aunt so and so and please help the astronauts on the space station. And you know, it just goes on and on. And we kind of smile and we go, oh, nice little boy, you know, tap him on. That kid's prayer is being heard. Prayer is powerful in the name of Christ because it reaches Almighty God. And prayer is powerful because it works. I have a, an experiment, not an experiment, but a survey I want to make. I want you to cooperate with me if you can, if you're able to. Raise your hand, those of you who have had prayers answered in the past. All right, I'm elected. Wish it was that easy, don't you? <laughs> prayer works when nothing else does. Prayer works in its own time, its own way, its own purpose, but it does work. Prayer works while we sleep. It works despite us in certain situations. God is able to do so much more than we ever imagined. He's always surprising us and prayer is our lifeline to that power. This is one of the reasons that we have designated the month of February here at Choctaw as the month of prayer. You've been hearing about that, so I'd like to kind of introduce that, uh, segue into that idea right now. Our purpose here in the month of prayer is to focus the minds and the hearts of each person in our congregation to a guided 
time of prayer that will last for not just one worship service or one weekend, but for an entire month. And that month will be February. So let me give you the nuts and bolts of how the month of prayer is going to work. Okay? And then the sermon will be yours. First of all, we've created a flyer, and I think I have a copy of it up here. I brought it with me. And I believe that every single person has received a flyer like this with information about the month of prayer in your mailbox. So if you didn't check your mailbox today, uh, I give you two good reasons to check it. One, the flyer on prayer is in the mailbox and your income tax receipts are in the mailbox. So there you got two reasons to go look at you. Now if you're a visitor and you don't have a mailbox, uh, that's okay. There are extra copies of this on the little tables out in the foyer and you can pick one up on the way out. Now the flyer has the following information on the activities and the features that will be provided for those who want to participate in our month of prayer. First of all, on the inside, as you see up on the slide there, there's a prayer calendar. On the inside of the flyer is this calendar with suggested topics for prayer for every single day of the month of February. Of course, you can pray for and about whatever you wish, but our hope is that you will include the daily topic so that we have the entire church focused on each topic every single day. So uh, let's say on the, uh, uh, on the 12th of February, it says here, pray for the unemployed, the homeless and the poor, February 12th. Well, we've got about 400 people in this congregation. Be nice if 400 people in this church were praying for the unemployed, the homeless and the poor on that particular day in their prayer time. You can add stuff, of course, but we sure would like for you to at least include this particular prayer. Okay, so that's one thing, the calendar. Now we also have online features as well. First of all, the, there's an online prayer calendar. Each day, the people who have the Remind app, you know what the Remind app is? It's an app for your cell phone. And what it's been designed for teachers to get in touch with their students if there's a snow day or don't forget your homework or whatever. So it's like an enclosed group. So we're using the app mainly to uh, advise our members, should there be a, you know, a bad weather on a Sunday, we want to let them know if services are canceled, you'll get a message on your app, there'll be a push notification, a little red dot or something that you've got a message, you click your app and it says, service is canceled or service is delayed till 2 p.m. or whatever. Well, we're going to use that Remind app in service of our month of prayer. And so each day, those who have the Remind app on their phones will receive a notification of the daily prayer topic as well as changes or updates to the calendar. For example, if it was today, we would add also, let's pray for the Deathridge family because of the loss of Rex. You see, we keep it fresh, we keep it up to date. Celestia will be either in the foyer or in one of the classrooms after services to sign you up to the remind thing, it's not very, I mean, I did it, so it's not very complicated. You know? uh, she's got forms and things like that you can set up. The first notification will be sent to those who have the app on Sunday, February 1st at noon. That, that'll be next Sunday at noon, you should get the first notification. All right, another online feature is the prayer board. There'll be a special online prayer board that will be available for members to post prayer requests, follow-ups, and comments. Just like you fill out the blue cards physically here and you hand them to Harold or whoever and they come up and they read them, well, we're going to have an electronic prayer board and you can post those prayers on the electronic prayer board. Simply go to the church website, choctawsaints.org prayer, or our Facebook page, facebook.com slash choctawcoc, and that information is in, the, uh, is in the flyer. Another feature will be, another feature will be Marty, looking like he's going hunting, but no, this is, this is, this is, uh, this will be prayer notes, and we've got Marty, because he was one of the very first ones that we videoed, these will be pertinent scriptures regarding prayer as well as comments 
and videos by various members sharing anecdotes and reflections about their own prayer life. These will also be available, and here, uh, there we go, these will also be available at choctawsaints.org slash prayer or the facebook.com slash choctawcoc. So what are you going to get when you go there? You're going to be able to see videos of people talking, short videos, you know, a minute, two minutes, short video of people, our people, talking about prayer in their life and also Marty will be also be providing uh, ideas, special scriptures, notations, just a kind of a devotional thought from time to time on this uh, website. We're also going to have some activities. First of all, we um, are going to have a Pray with the Elders feature. Every Sunday morning and every Sunday evening, as well as Wednesday evening, two of our uh, elders will be available in the elders conference room to pray and offer pastoral counseling to any members, any individuals that would need that. You simply go to the elders conference room after services and they will be there. And that'll begin on Sunday, February the 1st. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and the elders will rotate two elders to be there to take care of particular needs during that month. Even if you just want them to pray for you as part of our prayer month. Uh, another feature uh, will be the preaching. It wouldn't be a month of prayer if the preaching didn't deal with the subject of prayer. So each minister uh, will devote at least one lesson to this topic in the month of February to kind of keep us focused on this idea. And then the last activity will be the prayer and fasting weekend. At the very end of the month, we want to add the component of fasting to our prayer uh, prayer month, and so we'll finish the month off with a 24-hour fast, followed by a final fellowship meal, a break fast, if you wish, here at the building, and a glorious time of prayer and praise and sharing at the end. So the fasting will be Friday, uh, September 27th, beginning at 5 p.m., and it will go till Saturday, February 28th, 5 p.m. This is a completely voluntary thing. We understand a lot of people can't, diabetics, new moms, you know, that type of thing, sure. And you'll get information about that. But if you want to try it, I, I know that Mike Coghill is going to be speaking on that topic in his lesson. He'll be providing information on fasting. The marvelous thing, we finish the month, those who are able to and willing, with a day of fasting, focus on prayer, we all gather here Saturday, 5 p.m., and we break our fast together with a marvelous fellowship meal, potluck fellowship meal, and then we'll come into the auditorium and we'll complete the month with a great time of fellowship, prayer, praise, uh, and encouragement. You'll see, we'll give you more information uh, as the time draws near as far as the prayer and fasting weekend. So I hope that everyone will participate in as many ways as you can this coming month. Now, in my lesson today, I haven't covered every aspect of prayer, obviously, you know, the types of prayers, the examples of how to pray. These will come as the weeks go by in the month of February. And in subsequent lessons and sermons, you'll also receive more information about prayer and also more information about fasting, why, how to do it effectively and safely, so on and so forth. But for today, I wanted to remind you lest we forget in all the details here, not to give up on praying as part of your Christian life and encourage those who don't pray regularly to begin making it part of their daily walk with the Lord. Why? One last reminder, because it's needed in the church and in your life. Probably the thing needed the most. We don't just think we ought to pray, we need to talk, take the time and actually do it. It's for everyone in the church. Not only do we all need it, we all can do it. We can all do it for ourselves and we should begin doing it for other people as well. Take the time. If you tell me you're watching four hours of TV a day and you don't have time to pray, if you're telling me you're spending six hours playing video games till two in the morning, you don't have 20 minutes to pray, something's wrong in your life, you need to turn that around. 
And remember, it's the power that sustains the church in its work and supports our faith, not to mention every other aspect of our daily lives. Now one prayer that is often on my heart is that each person in this building, and if I could take the time, I'd go and name every name, each person in this building be right with God. Because when you go down deep inside the problem many times causing our angst, our stress, our fear, is that we're just not right with God for whatever reason. And so I pray that those who are putting off obeying the gospel will hesitate no more and obey God in repentance and baptism so that their prayers for salvation and other matters will be heard. And I pray constantly that brothers and sisters will have the courage to remove whatever sin or hardness of heart that separates them from God or separates them from others. That they'll get rid of that thing so that they can be right with God. And I pray that the Lord will send us godly people who will want to join our church family here in Choctaw. That's what's on my heart. That's what my prayer is this morning. If these are calling you in any way, then I pray that you will come forward now and that you will accept the Lord's invitation as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.